Thank you, Professor Jha. That's a very generous introduction. It's my pleasure to be on the webinar. So um, I'm going to talk about the nutritional management of children with CKD. As you all know, the pathophysiology of chronic kidney disease is multi is uh, has multiple different facets to it, including inherited conditions, um, malnutrition with severe uh, severe symptoms of catabolism, inflammation playing a role, metabolic acidosis, and renal anemia playing a picture here. The renal losses of water and electrolytes can be particularly important in some of the younger children. We also have issues with renal osteodystrophy and hormonal disturbances. So some of these, of course, are modifiable risk factors, and I would particularly like to focus on that. So in the course of my talk today, we'll talk about why bother with nutrition, what is the importance of it, uh, talk about enteral feeding in children, a few words about gastrostomy feeding, and what the guidelines recommend, and then a case study. So unfortunately, not all our patients are like this lovely big bonny baby over here, and feeding is really a big issue in pediatrics. We know that the energy cost of growth, that means the amount of energy expended in growing, is particularly high in the first month of life, as much as 35%. It then plateaus a little bit, to about 3% at 12 months of age, and then is considerably slower thereafter. And the growth velocity is a very sensitive indicator of the energy status of a person. There are papers that suggest serum albumin is a strong predictor of outcome. And indeed, I'm sure it is a predictor, but it has multiple facets to it. So it may be associated equally with nutrition as with inflammation. There's also studies that suggest that short stature, that the start of dialysis is a marker of poor outcome. And this, to me, this indicates the multifactorial, multifaceted aspects of growth. An eminent pediatric nephrologist has said, dialysis is easy. It's the feeding that is difficult. And indeed, the more I work in pediatric nephrology, the more this is obvious to me that it's the feeding. And particularly for parents, that is the biggest struggle they have. So we know there are phases of growth with early feet growth in fetal life and the infantile phase, which is almost entirely dependent on nutrition, the childhood phase, which depends on growth hormone, and then the pubertal phase, which depends on the sex steroids as well as growth hormone. And through these different stages, as I said to you before, the calorie in incorporated into tissues is the highest in those first few months of life. This study is more than uh, 35 years old, but it's a very interesting paper which looks at the percentage of the dietary nutritional requirements. And compared to normal, it says that when there's more than 80% of the DRI for energy, for, uh, for carbohydrate and energy provided, then growth will be normal, as you see on that graph. However, if you have low 80 percent um, and especially 60 to 80 percent, there's a reduced growth velocity. And then anything below 40 percent causes a complete cessation of growth. And there's the energy is required just for replacement of tissues and not for new growth. Um, causes of poor nutritional intake can be many. In chronic kidney disease, um, patients um, due to multiple reasons, including altered taste sensation, multiple medications they're on, some are polyuric and have no appetite, no, uh, no energy and appetite for food, and the hormonal regulation of appetite and satiety is altered. Patients can have vomiting, and it's a very, very common battle for us pediatric nephrologists. This is partly due to gastroesophageal reflux, but also to a large extent due to abnormal intestinal motility and high levels of, of hormones that we'll come to. There can be a disturbed feeding history if children from a very, very young age are, uh, have multiple operations, procedures, tubes, et cetera. And then some, many children these days have multiple comorbidities and neurological is issues as well. Um, when a patient on dialysis, they may be severely fluid restricted. There may be significant dialysate losses to, to deal with. And peritoneal dialysis itself can lead to a full abdomen, a feeling of fullness, and also constipation. So, so many different factors to look at. Now, the older GI motility and appetite control 
um, re results from a number of hormones that are deranged. This includes the polypeptide hormones like cholecystokinin and gastrin, which are associated with gastric emptying, GI motility, and, uh, and actually postprandial motor activity. The other hormones, such as the cytokines, regulate appetite, and um, therefore the, the feeling of hunger and the feeling of satiety, which our patients really suffer from. Um, increased levels of leptin are seen in chronic renal failure. Uh, they reduce the appetite and increase the metabolic rate, resulting in a catabolic state. And then ghrelin is becoming more important as an appetite regulator, and certainly its levels are also affected in, uh, in CKD. Now, a study from the International Pediatric Nephrology, uh, International Pediatric Peritoneal Dialysis Network, looked at uh, looked at the uh, growth and nutrition in a cohort of 153 children on PD who were under two years of age. And the graph here shows you the prevalence of use of um, different feeding devices in young children. So from gastrostomy use, which is very common in North America and to an extent in Europe, um, NG tube use is more common in Europe and Latin America. And then no sort of supplemental nutrition is the situation in Asia and Turkey. And um, of course, the tube is just the device through which the nutrition can be put into a patient. It's not your final answer, clearly. So we need to think also about what you do with that tube and how you utilize it to feed your patient. So let's look at some outcomes here. Um, the advantages of gastrostomy, particularly over an NG tube, are, is the improvement in vomiting, vomiting appetite and nutrition. Um, it, it doesn't interfere with oromotor skills. We frequently see that in children who had an NG tube and then go on to subsequently have a gastrostomy, their vomiting stops. And I think a big reason here is that you're no longer, you no, no longer have a tube that passes through the gastroesophageal uh, sphincter and causing a constant irritation of that sphincter, which then leads to the, uh, to the reflux. Um, of course, a tube allows the ease of medications and it is conveniently hidden under the clothes. We use it very, very frequently in my practice here and around the UK. Um, most parents, once they've got over the slight fear and anxiety about an operation, actually love the tube. They become completely dependent on it. Those battles every day to try and give the child the fluid and the medicine and the feed goes away completely and the child can still eat because there uh, there's there's no impedance and no sort of nothing in their, their mouth causing irritation and they do eat better um, uh, once actually that catabolic state goes away with improved nutrition um, in this study again from the pd network they showed that the time a patient or a child had a gastrostomy influenced the final height uh, development. So the height SDS scores are shown here, and children who have gastrostomy feeding achieve the best height SDS scores um, as compared to an NG or demand feed. So these are the different devices we have. You see the little child on the left of the screen have with a peg tube. Uh, you see a button on the right hand side of the screen. And these are the um, the, the, can you see me? So the peg tube. Um, the peg tube is not initially a surgery. We put in a manifold catheter and only later replace it with a peg. So the peg is uh, is one subtracted form. Uh, now, there can be complications of peg feeding, but they're extremely rare. And at least in my center, we see less than one in a thousand or way below that. Um, our procedures are now performed with our interventional radiologists. And the advantage of this is that they actually do this fluoroscopically. So the day before the gastrostomy surgery, <clears throat> they, put, they, they give um, a contrast uh, and actually opacify the bowel. So then at the time of surgery, at the time of endoscopic surgery, they can see the bowel very clearly, and that reduces any risk of bowel perforation or of, of causing a gastrocolic fistula. The other complications are listed here. 
And of course, one of the more common complications is gastroesophageal reflux, especially in children with, uh, with uh, disabilities and learning disorder, where you then need to sometimes consider a missing conduct like this. However, one of the most serious complications, of course, is peritonitis. And we have to think very carefully about this, particularly in our children on TV. So now, if you look at this uh, slide here, the gastrostomy placement technique can be an open procedure or a stand surgery, as it's called, or it could be a percutaneous procedure, such as a peg, a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. The peg, the percutaneous insertion, can be done by a surgical team with laparoscopic, or it can be done by an interventional radiologist using a fluoroscopically guided placement technique. The most important factor here is that any sort of percutaneous placement is a blind procedure, which therefore means that there's a risk of spillage of gastric content into the peritoneum. The gastric contents are obviously not sterile, and therefore you can induce peritonitis, particularly so in a child on PD. And this is um, very important to consider because in a patient on, who, who is on PD or likely to need PD, there can be the timing of the gastrostomy placement needs to be carefully considered. Ideally, it should be before the PD catheter places. If the patient arrives to your unit in time, and you have time for planning the different procedure, and there's no urgent need for dialysis. In other situations, it can actually be done at the same time as a PD catheter insertion, and even this is safe. But the thing that must absolutely not be done is to, is to do, a, uh, do a PEG insertion after commencing PD. Because in the studies to show an extremely high risk of, sorry, an extremely high risk of peritonitis, um, and indeed fungal peritonitis, that has even led to death, and meet a requirement to transfer the hemodialysis. If one attempts to be put in a peg um, in a patient, an endoscopic procedure in a patient already on PD. Compared to this, open surgery is much, much safer and has much lower risk. The key guidelines from 2008 on nutrition have emphasized this point as well. And you will see that they say an open gastroscopy can be performed safely in children on PD with suitable precautions. Now, the suitable precautions they're talking about are giving, um, giving uh, antibiotics and antifungal agents for about five days. So even with an open procedure, they recommend that we cover the patient with antibiotics and antifungals because there's still a risk of therapy. So what I'd like to do now for the remaining few, um, 15, 20 minutes is to do a case for this discussion. So to start with a newborn baby, consider the different issues and problems one encounters and go through their, um, their story, so to speak. So we talk about a child, um, a male infant with PV valves and dysplastic kidney. Um, he's born at 30, uh, so he's born at 38 weeks of gestation, weighing 2.1 kilos, and has a length of 45 centimeters, and all of these measurements are on the second center. Um, he doesn't require any respiratory support, he's catheterous and has a good urine output, and let's now discuss how we manage his nutrition. So remembering that this is a talk on nutrition, we're not going to discuss any other aspects of his overall care or his urological care. Clearly, all this happens side by side, obviously, but we need to focus on nutrition here. So for this newborn baby who has a good urine output, what would you do? Would you keep him milk by mouth, withhold his milk feeds and start clear fluid, start a low electrolyte feed if the mother doesn't want to breastfeed, or would you encourage breast breastfeeding if the mother wants to do that? Or would you start a baby formula um, in this situation? So many different op options here. Clearly, we can't have a you know face-to-face -face interactive session, but each time I'm going to present options to you and then the answer. So just think about it yourselves, yeah, as we go through it. So here in this situation with these different options, I would in the first instance encourage breastfeeding if that's what the mother prefers to do or otherwise start a normal baby formula milk. And please note, we're talking about a normal formula, not any specific renal formula, yeah? 
Now the reasons are um, clearly if the mother wants breastfeeding, we'd like to support that. Or we use a weight infant formula. Ba the baby will need two to three hourly feeding in order to maintain adequate nutrition. We often increase the volume of feed for these babies quite quickly, up to 150 or even 180 mils per kilo per day. Particularly in the case of, uh, of polyuric babies with PU valves, this is something one can safely do. Um, now, if the intake from breastfeeding alone is inadequate and the child's weight remains static, then a standard infant formula can be offered as a supplementary. Um, at the age of zero to two months, I would aim to give between 96 to 120 calories per kilo per day, a protein intake of 2.1 grams, and the food volume, as I mentioned. So, um, this isn't too different from what a normal baby should have. Yeah? So, this is what we encourage a good intake. Now, the energy requirements, um, as defined by KBOK, are that the babies of this age should receive 100% of the estimated energy requirement for their chronological age. Um, um, I would individually adjust for physical activity level and the body size um, of the child and adjust their energy intake based on their response and weight gain, keeping in mind that acceptance is one of the most important aspects of this. Um, I've provided a little table here for you to look at the age, uh, with the child's age, their uh, estimated energy requirements, um, and energy expenditure, and um, how one needs to adjust this um, uh, at different ages. So, the next important factor is how often would you follow up this child? And I think this is a very, very crucial thing because most pediatricians would start off correctly, but if you don't see the child often enough, you will automatically lag behind. So remembering that the expected weight gain um, at that age is 200 grams per week. So if a child's weight were to increase from 3.5 to 3.9 kilos in two weeks, you have to increase that protein accordingly their calories accordingly, and the volume of feed accordingly. And if you didn't see this child regularly enough, you could lag behind, and then and then the catch-up growth obviously becomes that much more challenging. So this, again, is very nicely presented by Kate Vicky, where they recommend, um, uh, recommend uh, a higher diet, a frequent review uh, of, of the, actually of the anthropometry and of the dietary intake uh, with the is being highest at the youngest ages of course. Now moving on with my story about this little child with valves. Uh, from day four to five, you note that he has high urinary sodium losses, his weight and blood pressure are falling, and the blood results are below. So we see that there's rising potassium, uh, he's a bit acidotic, he's hyponatremic, the urea level is slowly rising. The phosphate is still within range for his age. Calcium levels are low and his creatinine is increasing. And the weight has dropped off quite a lot and he's now below his birth weight. So at this stage now, what would you do? Would you sit back and say, let's wait and watch? Would you stop the breastfeeding? Would you put in a nasogastric tube to provide daily nutritional requirements as top up to oral feeds? or put in an NG tube to provide the daily requirement as a formula and allow the breastfeeds as extra? Could you start a sodium supplement or a bicarb supplement? And as you think of your answers, this is what I would do. So I would put in a nasogastric tube to provide the da daily nutritional requirements and then allow breastfeeding as extra. I'd also give a sodium and, uh, and a sodium bicarb supplement, both because of the high urinary losses these children have. So here, um, moving on, as we go through a few more days of life, the child's weight and BP now increase, and that's all thanks to the sodium you're giving. But unfortunately, the urine output starts to drop, there's edema, and the blood results are clearly deteriorating with... Um, with the creatinine rising rapidly, hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, and, um, and the acidosis persists. So at this stage now, what shall we do? 
Should we change all the feet to a low electrolyte formula? Should we substitute some of the whey based formula with a low electrolyte formula or add in proprietary vitamins or start dialysis? And here at this stage, what I would do is uh, substitute some of the whey based formula with a low electrolyte formula and also start dialysis. So, um, and the, with low electrolyte formulas, I mean, of course, every country will be different. This is what we have here in Europe. And if we give this child, if you look in the top, uh, what's at the top? I can do this um, left hand corner. If you give 180 mils per kilo per day in a 2.3 kilo baby, this is the amount of feed you'd give. And looking at the different formulas available and the different mixes of things you can use, um, we have these standard formulas to reduce the, to give a low potassium, high calorie, uh, calorie dense feed. Um, and these are the options we'd use. Clearly, it might be diff it will be different in India. You need to look at what formulas you have available. Now, um, of, with all these changes, uh, the fluid balance is improving, but the child's weight is static. So the child is now on dialysis. You can see the biochemistry is under better control, but you will see that the albumin levels are very low, at 28. And, um, and uh, the main cause for this, of course, is a loss of, uh, of albumin into the dialysate. And this is something we very commonly see in the youngest children, um, where, um, where um, the protein losses into dialysate are extremely high because babies are fast transporters on dialysis. So here, how do we manage this situation now? Do we increase the dialysis further? Um, do we change any of their medications, or increase the protein and calorie content? Um, shall we concentrate the feeds or shall we add in vitamin and mineral supplements or even start growth hormone? So lots of different possibilities here. And um, what I would do at this stage, what we do in my center, is we'd start concentrating the feeds to meet the energy and protein requirements um, for PD. So what we do in our, in our unit is we aim for urea levels below 20 in the youngest children and increase the protein up to even between two to four grams per kilo per day um, to, to achieve this. Um, the feed volume, of course, needs to be carefully adjusted in a child on PD, so you're not overdoing it. And the transperitoneal protein losses need to be adjusted. Now, there are some studies and calculations to suggest that this is going to be approximately 0.3 grams per kilo per day, which is your transperitoneal loss. Clearly, this varies in each individual child, and of course, it varies also on your, depending on your PD prescription. Um, and the normal feed concentration can be increased so that you have a lower volume, higher concentration feed going from 13 to 16%. Now, in this situation here, again, just as an example, here you have um, the volume of feed we'd be giving to this child and examples of feed we'd use with the energy and protein requirements here. So Kedoki have, um, have stated that in a chronic kidney disease stage three, uh, we need to provide between 100 to 140% of the dietary reference intake for, for protein, for ideal body weight. But in stages four and five, increase this up to 120% of, of the DRI. And in hemo or PD patients, add in that extra bit to compensate for losses. Now, in hemo patients, you should not really have losses because the hemo membranes are very, very um, well designed these days. But certainly for PD patients, you may need to do that. And here again is just a simple table if it helps you. Um, uh, in children of different ages, on um, with their dietary dietary reference intake for he for healthy children, and the amount whoop, the amount you'd need. This is not good. The amount you'd need on hemo and PD. So um, the, the, uh, the, the protein intake, again, sorry, this is a bit of a duplication, but this is looking at different studies that have looked at the reference intake for protein at different ages and, um, and suggest the provisions needed for this. Um, so what about calcium and phosphate? Now, um, 
we saw in our um, in our uh, patient that they were becoming hypocalcemic, and this is because the growing skeleton has a very very high need for calcium. So the calcium content of a healthy skeleton of a healthy newborn baby is only about 25 grams, and this increases up to 1.2 kilograms in a healthy adult male. So there's a huge amount of skeletal accrual of calcium that takes place. And this depends really on the rate of growth as well, being most rapid in the first year of life. So uh, the most recent KDOKI updated guidelines in 2017 have taken into account the need for, for growing bones and the ch child's requirement for calcium. And so you will see that some of these, these um, uh, these uh, guideline statements have been modified more recently with paying special attention to calcium requirements in young children. And they suggest maintaining serum calcium within the age-appropriate normal range, keeping in mind that young children have a high requirement for calcium and therefore actually uh, their serum calcium levels are actually physiologically higher at younger ages. In addition, uh, they suggest that the choice of phosphate binder therapy is based on serum calcium level, and it would be entirely appropriate to start with a calcium-based phosphate binder in most children. Uh, finally, in terms of using calcitrol and vitamin D analogs, again, the whole uh, focus is on keeping calcium in the normal range. Now, these recommendations are quite different from the older recommendations, for those of you who remember them, where, uh, and certainly the, these recommendations are very different from, the, from what is said for adults, where calcium is being considered more and more a harmful thing for cardiovascular calcification. If we go on to look at serum phosphate levels now, in um, again, the most recent KDOKI recommendations state that in patients with CKD, um, 3 to 5D, um, the treatment should be based on serial levels of phos calcium phosphate and PTH, so not on any isolated single laboratory reading, of course, you know, provided it's not desperately high uh, for calcium. In addition, um, this phosphate lowering therapy suggests lower phosphate towards uh, towards the normal range, and uh, and it, it, very importantly, as we are discovering in recent times, um, the yeah. use of food additives um, as preservatives really um, are a very huge contribution to the phosphate intake. These additives are often highly absorbed, um, and they're not um, not bound by our usual calcium-based phosphate binders. So we need to be extremely careful about their use. Um, a, a year ago, we wrote um, recommendations for vitamin D for native and active vitamin D uh, as our ESPN uh, guideline development committee. And um, I won't go through any details. It's all available on NDT. But we recommend keeping the vitamin D levels above 25, above, sorry, 75 nanomoles per liter or 30 nanograms per mil. And we recommend supplementation to achieve this. So coming back to our little baby now. So this baby continues to vomit and his growth is static. Despite giving him a continuous uh, drip of feed, um, as in a, in a continuous 24-hour feed, maximally concentrating the feed, um, all anti-reflux medications, and also optimizing dialysis. So now what does one do for this child? Would you consider TPN? Would you arrange a percutaneous gastrostomy or a surgically placed gastrostomy? Remember, this child is already on PD, yeah? So the one thing I would absolutely not do is a surgically placed gastrostomy. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, is a percutaneous gastrostomy, sorry. I would also not give this child TPN. Um, in, my, in the last 20 years, I've used TPN about twice in a dialysis patient, in, in two different dialysis patients. It is not beneficial, really. The volume restrictions rest uh, that we have for our dialysis kids means that you have very low energy achievements through this, and therefore it would not really be beneficial. Again, of course, you do not want a percutaneous tube in a child already on PD because of a high risk of fungal peritonitis. And so what I would do here is put, a, put in a surgically placed gastrostomy. So uh, to conclude, uh, we need careful attention to nutritional requirements and early intervention is critical to prevent malnutrition rather than to try and treat it. 
An input from a pediatric renal dietitian is extremely helpful. Um, enteral feeding improves growth in many or most children on dialysis. Um, there must be some caution with gastrostomy placement in children already on PD, and the protein requirements, particularly in children on PD, must be carefully and frequently monitored. Um, now, just a few conclude, other concluding remarks. Some of you may notice I have not said a single word about growth hormone so far. We do use growth hormone in my center, but use it infrequently. And the most important thing is if you have achieved adequate nutrition um, by whatever means you need, and the child is still not growing, and they don't have hyperpolyphyroidism, and other um, contradictory factors, only then consider growth hormone. So the use of growth hormone before optimizing nutrition is a huge waste of money, and I would strongly work, uh, not recommend it. The second thing to keep in mind for those of you who may have heard me speak before, I read, and for all of the, all of you who visited my center, you see that we use gastrostomy frequently, and we firmly believe in it. Um, I, I, you know, it, it really is easier to put in a dialysis tube, but often one can achieve many months or even a few years of non-dialysis uh, time for a child by optimizing their nutrition. We have very recently developed a renal nutrition task force as uh, initially as an initiative from the ESPN, but now also it will be adopted by IPNA. And our aim here is to ensure best practice in the nutrition management of CKD in children. We have a team of six dietitians and six nephrologists from across Europe and North America. And our main goals here are to formulate clinical practice recommendations to enable best practice of, uh, in pediatric nephrology. We aim to provide education and training resources for healthcare practitioners, um, as well as, of course, for patients and their families. And eventually, also to promote research in the field of pediatric nephrology. So with that, thank you very much. I'm happy to, um, to address any questions here now on my email address is available if you wish thank you thank you very much uh, dr shaw for that very very useful presentation you have brought out a number of issues which we generally don't consider on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis uh, i i i'm sure that many pediatric nephrologists do but as adult nephrologists the much of this is useful this is particularly of value because in many cities in India, as you know, it is the adult nephrologists who are forced to manage even children.